Good evening, everybody. Nice to see everybody here tonight. Uh, I'm Janet Rossent, and I'm president and scientific director of the Gairdner Foundation, and we're your hosts here tonight. Actually, that's not true. We're all being hosted here by uh, the uh, Science World and Life Sciences BC. But I am here to really welcome you and to tell you a little bit about Gairdner. Uh, this is a Ga Gairdner Global Perspective Panel that we're hosting tonight on the future of therapeutics. Uh, we'd like to thank our presenting sponsor that helps us, the Gairdner Foundation, put these events on, and that's Tell Us Health. Uh, for their generous support of our entire panel series. And really, thank you again, our partners here tonight. We gratefully acknowledge that Science World is located on the traditional unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh peoples. The Gairdner Foundation itself celebrates and recognizes scientific excellence through the annual Canada Gairdner Awards. In the last 65 years, again, the foundation has been running since 1957, we've given out 411 awards to really laureates from 40 countries, 96 of whom have gone on to receive the Nobel Prize. This is really the prize that is one of the best in the world, recognizing health sciences researcher, researchers whose research has really contributed to improving human health. But we don't just give prizes. We reckon that it's very important not just to celebrate science, but to use the, the excellence of our awardees to help us convene leaders and inspire the next generation of scientists and innovators. And now I'm going to show you a video that tells you a bit more about Gairdner. Tonight, we celebrate you, your teams, your families, and your incredible research that inspires us all and is changing the future of medicine. Cheers. Uh, being a Gairdner Award recipient is a life-changing event. And it's a great privilege for me, not just to be a recipient, but to have the opportunity to have the wisdom and to show how thankful I am by returning to participate in Gairdner Week. I am also thankful for all of those people who try to make my life miserable. They made me work harder, improve myself, and without them, I wouldn't be here. A lot of the program is very inspirational to the next generation of scientists and people having the opportunity to share their stories, their paths, their many adventures to connect every year on a consistent basis with a large diversity of future scientists who may not know they want to go into science. The speakers today were all huge influences in my current research and just the field in general, and it was a wonderful opportunity to hear them speak firsthand and learn about really important research happening right now. The biggest excitement is really sharing what we do with others. We met with high school students and saw the great enthusiasm they have for science and their careers. And we hope to stimulate them to go on and do great work later. After this talk, I feel so excited because I'm actually seeing those real, like, legends <laughs> in person. So the whole idea of these awards are to stimulate science, public health, and an interest in global health, which I hope will influence many people. Finding and fueling that passion, I think, is key. As research for, for most people, it's a long game. So I hope that gave you a little taste of the excitement of the Gairdner Gala, which takes place every year in October when all the laureates gather. But I think it also illustrates that we really are trying to touch the lives of everybody. So tonight we're here to really touch the lives of you and to talk about the particularly focusing on the work of our keynote speaker and leading on from his work to a broader discussion about the future of therapeutics. And of course, our keynote speaker, Peter Cullis, uh, probably is somebody who's very well known to most of you here in the audience. We're going to hear from him first, and then we'll have a panel discussion. It's going to be moderated by Tiffany Chu from uh, VP of Communications at Abcelera. Uh, and then we have four panelists from uh, the local community across the life sciences, the very strong life sciences sector here in BC. So let me introduce our keynote speaker. Peter Cullis is professor of the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at the University of British Columbia. Um, 
Uh, he received the 2022 Canada Gardner International Award, along with Kathleen Carrico and Drew Weissman, for their pioneering work on the technologies that underlie the highly effective COVID-19 messenger RNA vaccines. And not only uh, the underlying technology for the messenger RNA vaccines, but certainly Peter's work on lipid nanoparticles is going to underlie many future therapeutics as well. So please let me uh, join me in welcoming Peter to the stage. Okay, uh, th thanks very much, Janet. Uh, the um, the Gardner Award is an award that comes with some, um, what's the word? Uh, the, uh, <coughs> the, they call on you at various, various at, at frequent opportunities to uh, give, uh, give talks in, uh, in various, uh, was it, we were in, uh, what was it, Quebec City about two, week, two or three weeks ago. And so this is a, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a demanding award, uh, but a very, <laughs> but a very uh, I have to say, an extraordinarily welcome one, of course. This is one of those awards that uh, is particularly sweet because it's your own country, and uh, the, uh, being recognized in this manner is wonderful. Okay, so I think the theme tonight is therapeutics uh, for the future, and... Um, but I'm really going to emphasize what, the, what is the revolutionary potential of gene therapies. I have a number of conflicts of interest. Uh, the acuitous uh, uh, therapeutics uh, plays a dominant role in this, and so I'd like to single that one out for a particular, um, uh, for a particular recognition. So many of you might have a, you know, a kind of a, a notion of what gene therapy is, and I'm just going to take you through on a very quick crash course. I've been told I only have 15 minutes, so I'm going to probably stretch that a little bit. So uh, if you have 30 trillion cells in your body. Uh, they, they all have a membrane around the outside that has lipids in it. It's a very important feature. Uh, they have a nucleus. Um, and uh, the... Um, the, the, the definition of gene therapy has gone, as a, there's a number of ways of defining it, but the American Society for gene Therapy, Cell and Gene Therapy has what I think is the best definition. It's very general. It's the use of a genetic material to treat or prevent disease, and that's essentially what I'm going to talk about today. So how can you use uh, DNA or RNA? How can you can use these molecules as medicines? And so that's what I'm going to go through for the first a few slides here. Now, Watson and Crick uh, discovered the, um, the double helix structure, which of course you're all familiar with, of DNA in 1953, and it was really clear uh, that the sequence of the bases, um, you know, coded for uh, proteins that were produced by cells. Uh, so they got the Nobel Prize in 1962. In 1961, it was discovered there was an intermediary in this process. Uh, so it's called messenger RNA or mRNA. So this is transcribed from the, um, from the genome in the nucleus. Uh, it comes out into what's termed the cytoplasm, which is the space between the nucleus and the outside of the cell. And there, it's uh, translated into a protein. So DNA makes RNA makes proteins. It's called the central dogma of uh, molecular biology. So in the intervening time between 1961 and now, uh, it's been shown that if you make messenger RNA, uh, that's uh, coding for a particular protein, and you find some way of injecting that into a cell, uh, then the protein that it codes for will be made. So really, your ce a cell can make any protein you want, not just the proteins it normally makes, if you get the right uh, messenger RNA in there. Now, I'm drawing attention here to Drew Weissman and Katie Carrico. They come into the story a little later because uh, they found a way in 2005 uh, to uh, make uh, RNA. That was, uh, the, the versions that were available before were, were, kind of, were toxic. They were immunotoxic and also didn't produce much protein once they got inside a cell. And they found a way to rectify that problem. Now, in 1998, Andrew Fire and uh, Craig Mello discovered that short pieces of RNA, so we have messenger RNA that can make a protein if you have a short piece of RNA called small interfering RNA and you manage to get that inside a cell, it'll very specifically silence uh, or stop a particular protein being made. Basically, it sticks onto the mRNA and stops it from being transcribed. And so these are potential therapeutics. If you want to stop production of a protein, uh, then 
Well, get, get a small interfering RNA which binds to the messenger RNA coding for that protein, for example, an oncogene that, uh, that codes for, uh, uh, causes cancer, uh, well, there's a stop, to stop that from being made and, you know, you've got a very effective way potentially uh, for uh, treating cancer. Similarly, uh, if uh, you need a protein, um, if you have a genetic disease that, like a hemophiliac, well, then you make the mRNA, and if you can get that inside a cell, uh, then you can make the protein and potentially cure the disease. So it's kind of remarkable. Um, these are you know, medicines that can cure pretty much any disease that, that, uh, if, we, if we can only get them inside a cell. Uh, so this has been realized for some time. It's been kind of a holy grail uh, for um, the, uh, you know, the medicines of the future. Now, the, the RNA-based genetic medicines are relatively safe because they don't affect the genomic DNA. They don't get inside the nucleus and affect the, uh, the DNA that's there. They're, they're outside that. And so they're not only potentially very effective, uh, but also um, potentially not very uh, threatening or toxic. So uh, most human diseases, and I'll give some examples of this towards the end, but everything ranging from a heart disease caused by uh, um, uh, hypercholesterol, I mean, basically having too much cholesterol around, well, that's just shut down the production of the low-density lipoprotein that causes the deposition of cholesterol in various tissues. Cancer, that's programmed the immune system to eliminate the particular cancer uh, an individual may have. Stroke, let's regenerate the neurons. I mean, all of these, pro these, all of these things uh, become possible uh, when, if you are able to control the cell using these RNA-based approaches. Rare dis diabetes, rare diseases, uh, you know, rare diseases are usually due to uh, some genetic defect. You know, if there's a protein that's not being made, uh, the, uh, for example, a clotting protein for hemophilia, uh, or Tay-Sachs or others, well, we can get that protein made. And we can, we can manufacture these medicines in times on the order of weeks now. So a very rapid response is a potential. So this is, this is you know, it's not 15 years and a billion dollars, which we're currently into in terms of developing a new drug. These can be highly personalized for individuals, and they can be done in a very short time. Now, the big problem here, of course, is that uh, these molecules can't get into cells on their own. Uh, you have an immune system that's very specifically designed to try and avoid that happening. Uh, genetic material getting into your cells is not viewed as a good idea by, by your, for obvious reasons. You don't want to get infected by everything that's coming around. And so they need delivery systems. I've got a particularly nasty looking delivery system here. Um, this is actually the SARS-CoV-2, <laughs> SARS uh, the, uh, the COVID virus. But anyway, this, the, most attempts at gene therapy have, have used viruses to try and introduce uh, new genetic, because this is what viruses do, is they, they, they infect cells and they, and they get the cells to make more of themselves, in essence. And so they put their own genetic material in. Uh, but <coughs> to be used as therapeutics has proved very problematic. They're very difficult to manufacture. They stimulate an immune response, so they only can be used once. They're very expensive. They can cause cancer, et cetera, et cetera. And so what is the alternative? And this is where the lipid nanoparticles uh, come in. So I spent nearly 50 years working on lipid nanoparticles, um, <clears throat> well, lipids in general. Uh, so I came to UBC in 1978, but I wasn't studying lipid nanoparticles per se. Uh, I was uh, looking at very basic properties of, uh, of lipids uh, in biological membranes, uh, their structural properties, and also the fact that there's different varieties on one side of the membrane or the other. And I got a, a grant for an NMR machine, which allowed me to study uh, some of those characteristics. But I got kind of waylaid, and you'll see an old picture of somebody in the audience here, as well as myself. Uh, we got intrigued by uh, the idea uh, that maybe these lipid-based systems could be used to deliver drugs. And we found a way of delivering, or of, of loading cancer drugs inside these, uh, these nanoparticles. And so Mick Hope and Tom Madden, who was right in the front row here, um, and, uh, and Marcel Bally and Lawrence Mayer and I, this, uh, <coughs> this was in, we formed a company for basically to fund beer every Friday and um, fund parties whenever we, whenever we possibly could. Uh, <coughs> the, um, that was the first company. The second one was more serious. We actually hired a real CEO for that. Um, we, couldn't, we, couldn't, we couldn't raise enough money. So uh, using to packaging up these old cancer drugs 
into these nanoparticles. And so uh, we were urged to switch to gene therapy. Now, I'm going to give a little bit of um, you know, basic science here, but in order to get these uh, DNA or RNA into a lipid nanoparticle is a very negatively charged molecule. And so in order to get it into a, 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 a lipid-based system, we had to use some positively charged lipids. And po but positively charged lipids, or cationic lipids, are really ta toxic. If you want to kill mice, this is really an excellent way to do it, as we found out. But we, we, we had a solution that was uh, there as a result of some of our basic work on the studying lipid asymmetry. We had a lipid that was a neutral pH, where the pH in your body, it was relatively neutral, it wasn't charged. And, but it, when you took the pH down to about the acidity of a lemon, um, then it was positively charged. And we thought, well, okay, well maybe we can use that lipid uh, to, uh, to load nucleic acids into a lipid nanoparticle. And maybe when we came back up in pH, that would be retained. And so we devised a way of uh, uh, dissolving the lipids in, uh, in ethanol and mixing it up with a DNA or RNA in water. And we would get these lipid nanoparticles coming out the other end. And so these were, these were potential vehicles now for nucleic acids in general. Now, uh, in 2004, I was pursued by an individual. I always characterize him as the mad Russian. This is Viktor Kotelyansky uh, through London. Uh, it was at a conference where so, somewhere in Soho you said, we have a delivery problem. Um, how do we get our small interfering RNA into the liver? You know, they wanted to, all night long, he it was formed uh, to uh, develop small interfering RNA or to shut down production of a particular protein. Uh, uh, the, the, but they didn't have any way of delivering their product to the, where it was needed. So how do we get that into the liver following an IV injection in vivo? So this resulted in a collaboration uh, with Alnylam that involved uh, Cuitus um, and, uh, and Alnylam and my UBC lab uh, that uh, went on for some seven years from about 2005 to 2012. It was a remarkably successful collaboration and uh, we ended up and this is where we get in some real science, but just for a second here, uh, the, um, we basically improved the potency of these systems a thousandfold uh, over, uh, this is essentially what this graph is, is showing, uh, over the course of these seven years without increasing the toxicity. And so we found a way to deliver this sRNA. In this, in this case, it was to silence a particular gene in the liver that we could mention, the protein we could measure very uh, readily. It, we increased the, the potency by a factor of 1,000 without increasing uh, the toxicity. So you can notice we could give a 1,000 times higher dose before we saw any hint of toxicity. And so at this, this point, we said, okay, well, maybe this could actually be a drug. And so, the, so what disease could we treat? And we chose a disease you never heard of, but it does affect about 50,000 people worldwide. And this is uh, hereditary or <coughs> hereditary amyloid transferritin induced amyloidosis. Uh, but um, it's basically caused by a protein that's made in the liver. And if you have a number of mutations in it, uh, then it will, <coughs> it goes, it's secreted into the circulation. And it forms long fibrils, uh, which deposit all over your body, but have really nasty effects in nervous tissue and in cardiac tissue. And there's really no effective therapy, and you die usually within uh, five years of diagnosis. Now, this is a nasty disease. I mean, this is what this picture is telling you. Uh, <clears throat> it's a wasting disorder, and if you get it, if you have trouble walking when you're in your 30s, you'll know what you're in for because you'll have seen a relative because uh, it's a hereditary condition, a uh, diabetes condition. So this is, really, this is where the gene therapy approaches get very simple. From a, this point of view, well, let's shut the production of this protein down. Um, it's causing the problem, let's, let's shut it down. And so we, Alnylam developed an sRNA, a small interfering RNA, that was going to shut down production of that particular protein. We put it into our um, lipid nanoparticle with the intent of uh, shutting down production of this protein. It was remarkably successful. Uh, so this is the results of a clinical trial that were announced in 2017, where uh, you know, the, the neural impairment score, as it's termed, um, you know, there was actually these patients were getting better over the course of the 18-month therapy, and similarly for qual self-reported quality of life, uh, strength, uh, ability to walk. Uh, all of the measures that were the secondary endpoints, as it's termed, uh, you know, they put on weights. I mean, the whole thing was an incredible success. This was approved by the FDA in 2018. 
and is now a, a very successful medicine worldwide. Well, I thought this was about as good as it was going to get in my career. Uh, you know, this, this was, here, here we had a previously fatal disease and we played a big role uh, in, um, in uh, getting, the, providing a therapy for it. Uh, so the, uh, once the drug went into clinical trials in 2012 or 2013, uh, and acuitous, we thought, well, maybe if we can deliver a small interfering RNA, which in drug terms is not that small, it's 13,000 molecular weight, but maybe we could deliver something much larger, like a messenger RNA. And so this, is, this was what uh, we set out to do. So um, packaging now messenger RNA to make a protein and see if we could make proteins uh, in the liver. And we found we could make any protein we wanted. Uh, the, your liver makes 70% of their proteins in your body. Yes, it, it doesn't seem to mind making a few more. Uh, so so the, uh, in this case, you know, this is what I say, if you want to win the Tour de France, then you put in uh, messenger RNA coding for erythropoietin. And uh, here you have super, super physiological levels of erythropoietin being produced. And this is in a, a, pig, a pig model. Uh, so the, and then uh, the hematocrits and all the rest of it increases accordingly. So, so this, as you can imagine, there's, there's myriads of diseases uh, that can be approached using this, using this uh, technology. But so this is where you got to get lucky in science. We'd already been lucky, but here we got lucky again because we were approached by uh, Drew Weissman. You'll have seen these pictures before. Uh, who was work, had been working with Katie Carrico, say, okay, maybe if you can express a protein in the liver, you can express a protein uh, in, um, that's coding for a viral protein after it's injected into your arm as a vaccine. Uh, so, but uh, this, so they had the mRNA, the messenger RNA, that we could do this kind of thing, uh, but they had a delivery problem of how they actually get that messenger RNA uh, inside, inside a target cell. And so the uh, same kind of question that Viktor Kotelyansky had. The first test was for Zika virus. And so this was uh, <coughs> the, uh, so here we're just picking a messenger RNA that's coding for, um, as a uh, term, a, as, a, as, a, as a protein that's on the surface of Zika virus, a pre-membrane, an envelope, glycoprotein as it's termed. And the, uh, <coughs> so we packaged that in the lipid nanoparticle and uh, injected that subcutaneously into mice and showed that they then had complete protection against infection by Zika virus. So all of a sudden, we had a huge vaccine opportunity on our hands. And so this led to a, um, <clears throat> this led to a collaboration with a company in Germany called BioNTech, uh, basically focused on a flu vaccine. And, uh, well, this was in 2017, 2018, 2019, in that time period. And, the, uh, and BioNTech, in turn, was working with Pfizer, um, <clears throat> again, on a flu vaccine. Well, of course, in January, February of 2020, all attention turned to the, uh, the pandemic. And so the end result of that was that our lipid nanoparticle, the one supplied by Acuitas, became the vehicle for the messenger RNA uh, that uh, to, for the spike protein on the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. So uh, the, the, um, this, this was an exciting time, as you can imagine, and we'll get, take some questions on this in the, in the panel discussion. But so that we knew this was going into clinical trials, we had no idea what the results were going to be. And I think we all remember in November of uh, 2020, uh, when the results of that trial were announced, and uh, you know, 95% efficacy, and uh, <clears throat> across all age groups and ethnic groups, and uh, et cetera, and, uh, <clears throat> re uh, reasonably well tolerated. And uh, they said at this time, you can see down in the corner there, that it was going to be 1.3 billion doses uh, made in um, in 2021. It was much closer to 3 billion than 1.3 billion. So it's, uh, it's played a major role in containing um, the, the, the global pandemic. So uh, been in six billion arms, I mean, my God, unbelievable. Just to close off in the last few minutes, the, the, uh, the vaccines are really uh, just the beginning, and this is what we can chat a bit more about later today. Uh, it's really the third generation of pharmaceuticals, first generation being small molecule drugs, aspirin, cancer drugs, et cetera. Second generation antibodies that are used for various therapeutics for cancer and other applications. 
The third generation is going to be these gene therapies that are exquisitely tailored uh, to the individual, either for replacing proteins that are not being made uh, <coughs> accurately as vaccines we've already seen, and gene editing is also a real, a real, <coughs> a big, a big theme in the field at the moment. We're going to see a universal flu vaccine before long. Um, so the whole, uh, this is just showing that if you have a lipid nanoparticle with mRNA coding for a number of proteins in, in influenza, it has total protection across a very wide variety of, uh, of strains of influenza. Cardiovascular disease, uh, that's just shut down the production of low-density lipoprotein. Uh, so this is knocking out a protein in the liver uh, that... Um, that uh, regulates the uh, the levels of low density lipoprotein in the circuit. It's like this is like a vaccine against atherosclerosis. It's going to kill 50% of it. I mean, you know, this is this is quite quite revolutionary treatment for heart failure. Uh, this is a study that came out last uh, last year. Uh, it's a CAR T cell therapy. Here, in this case, we're targeting the immune system. Uh, using a um, uh, this is an in vivo approach to reprogram T cells so that goes after fibrotic cells or scar cells uh, in the heart, and uh, these are artificially induced. But you can see the um, you know the lack of scar tissue, the ejection fraction goes up, et cetera. Treatment for cancer, um, you know, if you can extract the cancer and find out on the outside, well, let's make an antibody against it. In this case. Uh, the uh, liver is now uh, where the <coughs> mRNA is, co is coding for that for that antibody. In this case, a bispecific antibody, so it takes a, it, it attracts a cell associated with the immune system, a T cell, and, and basically tags it together with an, a cancer cell, an established tumor. In this case, uh, being uh, treated in a very effective way, and more effective actually than using the protein that's made artificially and then injected intravenously. Uh, individualized cancer vaccines uh, are certainly very much, here, here you take a messenger RNA that's uh, <coughs> coding for a particular, you know, say 20, um, and all cancers have mutations, well let's find the ones that are particularly immunogenic, take pep make peptides of, of them, um, have the mRNA coding for the lot of them, and then use that as a very individualized and personalized uh, vaccine. So you can see the potential uh, that uh, it, it really covers a huge amount of, um, of therapeutic opportunities. So we're going to see a multi, I mean, people are predicting that perhaps as many as 40 to 50 percent of the drugs, you know, five to 10 years from now are going to be based, they're going to be these genetic medicines. And they really are going to revolutionize medicine in the same way that they've revolutionized the vaccines that, uh, you know, we, we have available now or, or in the process of, of revolutionizing it. Uh, <clears throat> chronic diseases, inherited diseases, et cetera. I'll just make one point here, and that is that you know, these are the, now, now the whole notion of having individualized, uh, personalized drugs is really on the table, uh, simply because if, if you're not making a protein and let's say a child is born uh, with some genetic defect, um, the sequence, find out which protein, which is a relatively straightforward thing to do, uh, <coughs> that's not being made, make the messenger RNA that codes for that protein inject that in and have the liver make it, we can do that today in a time on the order of, you know, a couple of months or less. So these are, the, 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 it's just a very exciting time. Uh, I just want to point out in closing that this, this is really the work of literally, oh, I was going to say hundreds, but probably closer to thousands of people. But it's really the result of work that, um, you know, as I say, started 40 years ago. Uh, Tom Madden, myself, Mick Hope, uh, <clears throat> um, Lawrence Mayer, Marcel Bally, uh, we've kind of stayed together over the years and uh, really made uh, British Columbia, Vancouver, into a central hub for these nanomedicines. We had no idea at the beginning it was going to have uh, the impact that it has had, uh, but it certainly has um, you know, surpassed our, uh, our wildest dreams. So with that, I'll uh, close and I'll take any questions you may have. So let's kick off with um, kind of where you left off, Dr. Cullis. You talked about the incredible potential of um, mRNA um, therapies and the technologies that drive them. Um, I'd, to the panel, I'm a, I would like to understand, 
you know, it sounds like it took 40 years for us to get to this place, or 50, depending on how you count. Um, I guess, where do you feel we are today? And what are the technologies that have enabled us to come to this point? Because it seems like there's been an inflection uh, in the use of technologies for, for therapeutics around mRNA and for proteins. Um, you're asking me first of all? I mean, there certainly has been an inflection. Uh, the, 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 uh, I think the, we're seeing an enormous, you know, in terms of investment, in terms of new companies being started. And, and see, the thing is, it used to be when you're doing a molecular bi biology you know, um, analysis, uh, you'd be finding basic information. Um, this person has got some, some, you know, some issue or in other organisms. But it's very difficult to translate that into therapeutic reality. Uh, but now the, you can make that transition very quickly. Um, so the potential for a new discovery in molecular biology being translated into a potential medicine is almost immediate. And I, I think that's uh, you know obviously a, a very exciting proposition. We have to get used to this. I mean, the, 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 the regulatory authorities for medicines are not used to medicines that can be developed in such a short time. And so the ways that we're going to be introducing them into the population is going to be a bit of a you know, that's going to be a, an interesting, an interesting uh, journey. Uh, but I think some of the needs are going to be pressing. When a parent has a child that has an issue and you can fix it, um, you know, at, least at least potentially, and probably you can demonstrate an, an animal model, then the pressure uh, to allow these medicines is going to become huge. Um, so just to kind of, I guess, uh, level set everybody in the room, uh, antibodies are a little bit different than uh, mRNA. They're proteins that your immune system makes um, to protect you against uh, infection. And so what's really, really cool about them is they're super, super specific. And so they've opened up this huge class of, of drugs that are very specific um, and don't have um, much in the way of side effects. And so we think, we're thinking about sort of the technologies that are necessary for antibody discovery. There's just been so much that has happened in the last last um, few years that allow that to happen. I mean, improvements in our, you know, immunization technologies that allow you to generate those antibodies, um, improvements in screening technologies that allow you to find and search for them, um, you know, all of the uh, developments in deep sequencing to allow us to, to decode and find those sequences, and then also how we express and characterize them from both a functional and a developability. And so um, being able to bring all those technologies together, I think, has been is huge in the field of moving, moving antibody discovery uh, so much faster to the clinic. Um, and we've seen that with our COVID work. So. What I find really exciting is that we are now in the clinic um, uh, looking at um, making these types of therapeutics available to, to, to people and to patients. Um, we were able to develop the COVID-19 vaccine incredibly quickly, but we're seeing now there's a flu vaccine that's now in uh, clinical studies, uh, late stage clinical studies. There are vaccines for RSV and, and other relatively uh, common viral diseases. But what I think is incredibly exciting is that we also now have uh, vaccines for tuberculosis and malaria in clinical development. And these are uh, uh, diseases that historically have been incredibly challenging to develop effective vaccines to, to prevent. But the versatility of messenger RNA, the ability to encode multiple different um, viral um, or bacterial proteins um, and put, package those in a single vaccine, uh, I, I really hope will allow us to come forward with a vac effective vaccines uh, to treat um, these diseases, which in reality Im uh, impact uh, uh, millions, hundreds of millions of people globally. Um, and, and this is what I'm really looking forward to seeing is uh, the clinical data coming out from those studies. Great. I'm sure happy to, happy to pile on here. I think um, one thing that's very exciting for me and where we are today is the uh, the versatility of the molecules that we can deliver through genomic medicines and, you know, essentially through the RNA um, nucleic acid-based therapeutics, medicines transitioning from an analog technology where we're designing 3D structures of like small molecules and chemicals to uh, designing the sequence, so a very digital technology. And the genomic medicine toolbox allows us to really uh, affect a gene in, in any way that's required to treat a disease, being it to, to turn it off, like the alnylam um, 
example you gave or to express a protein like the vaccines examples or to edit genomes or to um, do all sorts of other effects in, in the biology. And so it's, it's really a, a, a time of creativity within the community and really enabling the, the broader scientific community to come together to, to treat diseases in ways that we've never been able to see before. And so just thinking a little bit more about that, um, you know, um, you know, the, some of the research I've seen recently is that the mRNA therapeutic market is about $47 billion, or projected to be, with a growth rate of about 17% every year. Um, antibodies is about $250 billion, um, with a growth rate of about 10% per year. Um, you've talked about vaccines for infectious disease. What are the other applications of both um, mRNA technologies as well as for antibodies? Um, yeah, the, right now, you know, clear, <laughs> clear areas people are going into would be vaccines, a, a critical one, both for infectious diseases as well as for cancer um, and, and you, harnessing the immune system to attack cancer. Uh, the rare diseases where we're able, where there's a very well-defined genomic uh, component to the disease is, is another key area. Um, but I would say that the technology is being applied in, in nearly every aspect of, of uh, diseases out there and the, the community is really finding ways to, to go after each one of these. And I think, as Tom said, we're seeing clinical validation of these different approaches um, coming on very quickly. I think, you know, one of the things that I find incredibly exciting is how we are combining um, uh, our advances in different technologies um, to come forward with, with uh, new ways of treating patients. We've made incredible strides in our ability to quickly sequence um, uh, genetic information. And we've used it at the BC Cancer Agency as a perfect example and BC Genome Center, where we have um, uh, incredible information on the specific genomic uh, makeup of tumors in individual patients. And we can now leverage that information to design patient-specific um, uh, vaccines, um, which will hopefully harness our own immune systems to, to attack the tumor that, uh, uh, that is ravaging pe uh, patients' bodies. And so, as I say, I think it's the juxtaposition of our um, uh, genomic uh, advances together with mRNA therapeutic vaccines, which is really very exciting for me. I think likewise, there's just so many applications for antibody therapeutics. I mean, antibodies can be used as therapies on their own. Um, they can also be used to, to hook up to cargo um, other drugs or RNA LMPs to bring them to where they need to be. And so, um, you know, when I think about all the different ways that they could help people, um, you know, infectious diseases, uh, cancers, autoimmune diseases, uh, Alzheimer's. Um, chronic pain, so many things, I just get so excited about the possibilities of, of where these technologies can go and, and how they can help uh, patients and their families. Yeah, well, the, one of the points to make is that uh, not only is it all very exciting, but it's all happening here. Um, so uh, British Columbia uh, is, uh, we, we can categorize ourselves as being global leaders uh, in this area. And, um, you know, this... This is a huge achievement, uh, the, uh, the fact that we're, we're, we're in that vanguard position. Uh, we're obviously fighting like heck to stay there. Uh, you know, there's a lot of competition. Uh, but in terms of the delivery system, which is really one of the most important parts of the, uh, the equation here, um, you know, we've, uh, we're now 500 people or so employed in companies locally uh, that are doing this work and um, are play, having a huge impact. Uh, across the world. Uh, so even though there is this pull towards places like Boston or the Bay Area, we've managed to resist that and uh, we've really managed to create this industry here. It's a really important thing uh, to maintain it and grow it, I think. And so do you think, um, what do you think the key hurdles and challenges are then to, I think, maybe both growing or continue to maintain that position, that pole position that, that uh, BC and Vancouver's in, but then also what are some of the challenges and hurdles around the technologies themselves? And, and, you know, 
how close are some of these therapies we're talking about? I know a lot of them are in trials, but Peter, you pointed out that there's a regulatory component as well where we're going to need to have folks who know how to evaluate these medicines as they come along. So I'm just thinking in terms of, I mean, obviously you have seen it play out in, in real life. What do you think are the key challenges that need to be addressed to realize the full potential of the therapies? Well, certainly the regulatory aspect uh, is good, but that's one that you can kind of see well because, because the forces are so huge. As I mentioned, for you know, a child born with, with a disease that you can, theor you know, just theoretically, but you know, very practically can, can have a big impact on. I think those are going to be the ones where the dri real drive comes in uh, for the, um, you know, for say Health Canada uh, to um, not only change some of us, but actually actively assist in that process. Uh, this is already being done with some of the the, the viral-based uh, therapies, but I think these the the, <clears throat> the the mRNA approach with the lipid nanoparticles has, you know, it has uh, is substantially more straightforward. Um, so that's a big one. Uh, the the um, we we the, the the other thing is that we, we, you know, our medicines now up till now have been uh, one size fits all. We 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 have medicines that basically. Uh, you know, we we do clinical trials of 10,000 people, and you know they, they they have some benefit, and for most of them. But the problem we have with that is that not everybody's average, and so you have these outliers. Uh, I think increasingly we're going to be able to tailor our medicines much more specifically to individuals and avoid some of the toxicities that arise as a result of your particular genetic makeup. And so that's another, you know, another. For the the the, the 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 range of possibilities here in terms of therapeutics is huge. One of the inexorable facts uh, is that you know uh, ninety percent of all cancers happen after the age of fifty. Uh, you get past that, and then uh, you know there's atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. You get past that, and then you're into dementia. So the, uh, <laughs> the, the <laughs> so this this is not a pleasant scenario. And so there's an increasing effort going on now to say, okay, well, if we really want to do something that's going to affect disease, maybe we should be going after aging as a very direct thing. And again, uh, some of these technologies lend themselves to that. Yeah, and I think of sort of some of the, the barriers, the technology, I immediately think of how long it takes to, to get into the clinic and actually help patients. You know, thinking about the antipony industry, um, it can take easily over five years to go from, hey, I've got this wonderful idea of how we can help people, to the first patient that you treat and, and you're just really checking for safety. And then it can take double that amount of time before you're actually on the market and, and really making a difference in a, in a lot of patients' lives. And so, you know, the whole process is incredibly complex and it requires this massive integration of, of technologies, but also expertise. And, and so I think that's something that we really, you know, at Upsellera have, have, have looked at and said, okay, you know, there's a different way of doing this. And, and by bringing all those, those pieces together, um, we're really trying to, to make that whole process faster. Um, and I think, you know, during, during COVID, we were able to go from a patient sample from someone who'd recovered from disease to bringing that um, you know, antibody medicine that we had discovered from their blood into a patient in 90 days. And obviously that's incredibly fast and under very special circumstances, but I think it does show there's an opportunity in our industry to, to really change how we're doing um, and speed this whole process up. You know, we've got great ideas, we've got great technology, um, we can really make a difference. So I'm going to take a slightly different perspective, you know, on, on the challenges ahead of us. And I think, you know, Peter did an excellent job of, of, of commenting on the fact that, you know, messenger RNA and, and sarRNA are inherently safe therapeutics because they're not making any permanent changes uh, to our cells. But we, we now are developing therapeutics uh, which are targeting um, genetic defects, for example, and, and making a permanent or, se or semi-permanent correction um, to those genetic defects. So, so what, I, what I would term true gene therapy in, in, in some ways. Um, those types of therapeutics can be incredibly powerful and, and incredibly beneficial um, to patients with a genetic disease. But I really think, um, uh, and it, it's, it's, it's happening now, but the regulatory agencies, um, uh, clinicians, physicians, need to be thinking about the implications 
implications of these types of therapeutics. And I think society as a, as a whole also needs to be aware of the potential um, you know, dangers to, if you've advanced too far down that path. And so I think that's a discussion um, that is, is happening now and probably needs to accelerate to ensure that we stay ahead of the curve in terms of the clinical development of these types of, uh, of gene therapy uh, therapeutics. Yeah, very good point. Um, and I'll just add a technical challenge, which I think is represented well here, um, which is the, the delivery component really is the, the challenge of the day right now. It continues to be where, whereby um, through the presentation today, uh, saw unlocking of the technology in the liver and then for vaccine technologies um, to really unlock the full potential of, of RNA medicines, genomic medicines, will require the delivery to all the tissues, all the cell types uh, within your body. And that is a you know, key problem being worked on by many, many groups here in Vancouver with some of the top talent here uh, and also all over the world. Wonderful. I, I feel like I want to pursue a little bit more, Tom, your comment on um, some of the what you call true genetic medicines. I'm assuming that with the gene editing, CRISPR editing, these types of things. Um, there's a, especially for a more, uh, I would say for all of us both working in science and those of us who don't work in science, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the sort of ethics around these types of technologies and those sorts of things. And just wonder for the panel, um, you know, what do you think are some of the common misconceptions about them that we would want the public to know differently about? Do you want to start, Tom? Yeah, I mean, I think you know one of the one of the things that uh, we we do need to clarify is there isn't the intention that these genetic changes become heritable. Um, so that you wouldn't pass them on to your children. And I think that's that's critically important in, in this discussion. Um, uh, but that requires a very careful uh, study to confirm that we're not changing uh, our oocytes, the eggs in a, in a, in a woman or, or, or the sperm and, and, and making any, any permanent change to, to the, their genetic makeup. Um, uh, but at the same time, I, I think there's always the risk that te the technology at some point in the future uh, would would you know, allow that possibility. And again, I think we need to address that in, in some of the discussions we're having today. You go ahead, Peter. Um, well, it's, it's the old two-edged sword thing, right? I mean, you have a very powerful technology that can be used for good. Uh, there's going to be, uh, the, the, we're, we're going to see the other side. I mean, the, the basis of this is, and that's really obviously the most exciting part, Instead of going in with small molecule drugs, et cetera, which in many ways you can just you can describe those as being poisons. I mean, they're very selective poisons, but they're poisoning a a particular you know cell in the body, whether it's you know cancerous, uh, you know causes cancer or whatever. Uh, but these are not poisons. These are using the genetic machinery of the, um, the of the, of the cell. We're we're using very basic biology. So. It's a whole different ball game, and, uh, and really, that's the reason that I was, as I was saying, that uh, you know, any disease, pretty much any disease you care to name, um, the uh, my wife keeps on telling me that I've got to get into the game of wrinkles. Uh, <laughs> that uh, this would be a, a <laughs> uh, but you know, all of, all of, uh, everything's on the table uh, is the uh, is, is the bottom line here, and uh, it's ca this is obviously causing a huge explosion. Um, of, of opportunity, um, but um, yeah, it's uh, it can go both ways. I mean, it's not uh, it's not unidirectional. Fantastic. I think um, I know that we were hoping to have a little bit of Q and A with the audience, and so um, Summer, do we want to open it up a little bit? Great. So I think that if you have a question, if you want to raise your hand, um, someone will bring a microphone to you. I think. I think we have in the. Here they come. All right. Do you mind passing that down? Thank you. So I'm, I'm totally ignorant in this this area. Um, but what I've heard is incredibly exciting, and I, I mean, it just sounds like here's the cure to every disease that exists, and. I was a little bit surprised uh, that some growth rates were quoted. I think the numbers were 11 and 17 percent. And uh, the obvious question is, why isn't this a much bigger number? 
And there was a question that was asked, and I think the response that I, under, uh, the way I understood it was, well, the way the system works, it just takes ages to get things into clinical trials and through clinical trials, et cetera, et cetera. So is anybody working on that and trying to fix that? I'm pretty old and I'm, I'm in a hurry, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think you may all start a little bit, but I think that you know there are the, the technical realities of biology, and and I think there's diseases which have clear genetic effects, and we can we know if we turn that gene off or if we express that protein, will have a huge impact. There's lots of diseases that are more com complex, and have a you know multitude of environmental plus uh, multi-genomic factors that would have an impact. So there is that factor there where the biology itself is, is, is a challenge, I think, to, to uh, delineate and to um, understand what cause and effect of a, of a drug to make. Once we understand that, hopefully then we can make the drug to be um, quickly and, 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 and very active. Oh, if you want to touch the regulatory part, Tom. Um, sure. I mean, uh, just to uh, uh, take a step back, I, I've never heard Peter described as, as lacking confidence or enthusiasm you know, for, for, for technology or, or for science. And, and, and I uh, share his excitement with science, but I also sort of recognize that in terms of development of a, of a new therapeutic, we need to err on the side of caution. And, and clinical trials are designed to ensure that a, that a new therapeutic is safe and it's actually effective, and the regulatory agencies are there um, to, to review all of that data to, to confirm um, that those findings before uh, a drug is, is, is approved. And I think we do want to um, continue to ensure that those safeguards are in place. Um, I think it's an excellent question, how can we speed up um, that, that process. Um, uh, the pandemic provided a wonderful example of what's possible. Um, and um, I, I would, uh, I mean, I, th I think even, even now, um, I, I'm encouraged by the fact that regulatory agencies have learned from some of the policies they put in place to accelerate uh, development of a COVID-19 vaccine, and, and they're applying those policies uh, to, to, to new vaccines today. So I think progress is, is, is being made, um, but I think we also have to recognize we're dealing with inherently conservative institutions. Can you, can you address malaria in the time frame that uh, COVID was addressed? Um, that, is a, uh, that is a fascinating question. Um, uh, and um, uh, historically, as I say, there have been dozens, if not hundreds, of clinical trials conducted to try to come up with an effective vaccine for malaria. Um, almost all of which have proven ineffective. And so again, reinforcing our need for caution with these types of therapeutics. Um, uh, I, 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 uh, you know, what, one of the things uh, that I think we sort of also recognize is that in development of a vaccine, you have to demonstrate that it's actually gonna prevent the disease it's intended to pre prevent. And inherently, that's a long process because you've got to allow a population to be exposed to that to that disease, to that virus, long enough for the incidence of infection to be high enough to come up with a, a differential or uh, between the, the the vaccine and, and any previous therapy. So I think there's some inherent um, limitations within the design of good clinical trials that do slow down that process. And I might just add that um, with the pandemic, um, and specifically for mRNA vaccines, because we hadn't seen that come to the stage in the same way, I think they have pretty strong safety profiles. It's six, I think you said six billion, Peter? Well, yeah, the, the, I, I guess, and just to go to Tom's point about the length of time that it takes to, to show that a vaccine works, because you've got to have the control group and the group that's getting the vaccine and they have to be exposed. It's one of the reasons that the vaccine was developed so quickly is because there were so many people getting COVID and so you could get the, so you could actually, you know, 44,000 people in, uh, in eight or nine months. I mean, that's, that's, not, that's not a minor, that's a pretty damn good clinical trial. Uh, but it was only because we had an awful lot of people getting infected. I think we have a hand here. 
Thank you for the fantastic talk. That was really fascinating. Uh, so it seems that you've managed to, I mean, first of all, package genetic material into LNPs to make them non-toxic, to increase the size of genetic material that you can package into them. What's the next big challenge for LNPs? Uh, I think Tom, Tom and, uh, and uh, James mentioned it. I think, James, you mentioned it. But they, they, uh, it's getting, we, right now we're really good at doing things with the liver. Uh, we can get the liver to make all kinds of stuff. And similarly, the vaccines are obviously good, um, but we are not very good at getting to other tissues. Um, we get into bone marrow, you know, where the, the blood cancers and so on would be, uh, so lymphomas, leukemias, uh, getting to the lung and, uh, you know, cystic fibrosis and, uh, the, uh, and obviously the brain. Anyway, there's all kinds of new tissues to get to, and then as each tissue we, you know, manage to, uh, manage to get the genetic medicines working in, uh, then a whole a whole bunch of new therapeutics become possible, and so that's where the pressure is on right now. It's trying to get us to you know various places to uh, um, have various beneficial effects. We have achieved actually in some ways getting to the skin. So maybe my wife's hopes will become <laughs> will become uh, validated one day. But <laughs> may I propose uh, antibodies as a mechanism to get your RNA on peas where they need to go? <laughs> Um, I was just wondering about genetic eye disorders leading to blindness and if there are any limitations that you could discuss regarding timing of delivery. So say somebody who's in their 30s may be concerned about this blindness, um, but with technology moving, is it going to be too slow? Will they have missed the gate and opportunity to these te technologies if they were supposed to be delivered, say, uh, when they were 10 or 5 or or 20 and that could also go with cancers or even aging creams as well should I be worried about Botox right now <laughs> okay so that the question was about uh, it sounds like degenerative eye uh, uh, diseases and Botox <laughs> so if I maybe if I could start because um, uh, the, there are studies looking at um, direct it doesn't sound terrible direct injection uh, of these therapeutics into the eye because you, you can access then um, the rods or the, or the cones within the eye and potentially deliver to those cells to, to, to address a disorder. Um, uh, that work is ongoing, but it's, it's, it's not straightforward. One of the, the biggest challenges is that that can give rise to um, strong um, uh, immune responses um, uh, to those types of therapeutics that could, could potentially exacerbate the condition. So I think the, uh, the, the approach is being pursued, um, uh, but uh, uh, there's still um, considerable work that's needed to ensure um, that we're, we're not triggering uh, inflammatory reactions um, while we're delivering these types of therapeutics um, to address those, those issues. Maybe just to add, I think I think the urgency is a good question too, and it um, it's a nice um, juxtapose, I suppose, to the conservative um, need um, on the regula regulatory side. But there definitely is, um, you know, a strong pull from the patients um, for for these new medicines. And I think the optimistic perspective here is that we've never been in a time um, in medicine that we've had such an inflection point and the ability to do things that we haven't been able to do at such a, a, a grand scale. And so we're seeing, you know, we work with hundreds of, of RNA companies and we're just seeing the creativity in the field to do all sorts of new things. And some of those things will work, some of those things won't be successful. But the, I think the time in biotechnology and the progress that will be made over the next um, decade or so will just be um, will dwarf everything else that we've seen before. Very exciting time. And maybe just to add to that, the, the timing question is probably important. So if someone has, it's been happening since they were a child and they're now you know, an older, um, you're probably not looking at uh, a gene therapy in, in, in the sense of replacing a protein, but in fact maybe in the application of regenerative medicine versus if it's early, then gene therapy might be more of a, uh, a suitable application. Is that fair to say? Hey, uh, fascinating talks and perspectives, thank you. One thing that I noticed when I was listening was that the, the example of the COVID 
for the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine was kind of unique in the sense that the target was, uh, you know, wasn't, wasn't patient specific and also that it was a record of that medical intervention is kind of saved by your immune system. I was curious about gene replacement therapies or a short interfering RNA based therapies that might require more regular, uh, you know, transfusion or whatever the, the proper word, more regular delivery. How long do we think that those uh, could last? How regular would that have to be? And do current manufacturing processes enable that kind of, you know, targeted development of uh, medicine on a patient patient specific basis? Um, yeah, this is uh, it's, this is a very individualistic or uh, individually uh, particular, the particular protein that you're trying to uh, you know trying to make. For example, some proteins will last for a long time in your body. Uh, other proteins, you know, say um, days or, or weeks. Uh, other proteins uh, maybe a, a few minutes. And so, um, you know, for obviously <clears throat> some you require large amounts and some in small amounts. But anyway, so these are questions that are now being, you know, they will be addressed. We will get sort of start to get more and more stable uh, variants of, uh, of messenger RNA. Uh, we'll start to get some, you know, ability to perhaps to get depot effects or, you know, basically osmotic pumps. So all of these things are, 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 are going to be possible. You can see ways that you might get there. Uh, but it's uh, the, 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 the main thing that we're doing right now is following biology. Um, you know, there's, uh, uh, with an IV injection, you, the liver is the first organ you hit, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> you're able to transfect it, and there's a whole bunch of things you can do there. Um, let's say if we inject into the eye, there'll be a certain subset of cells that will hit, and as a result of that, you know, they'll say, okay, with well, certain diseases that are you know, low-hanging fruit or whatever you want to call it, uh, that, uh, will, that will expand from. And so that's the way that, that that's really what's happening at the moment is the uh, is there's the <clears throat> okay which tissues are affected when I inject into the brain or into into other into the other into other tissues if I get long circulating systems which tissues do they preferentially transfect can I get immune cells uh, all of these all of these are are, are, are really vibrant sources of uh, or <clears throat> sources of subjects of research at the moment. Maybe just on on the manufacturing piece of that too, as you look at um, you know what's possible with these technologies. Um, everything made in the lipid nanoparticle RNA drugs is synthetic, and put together through through physics through a self assembly process. Um, and so in the next within the next decade, we'll have machines about the size of this coffee table that can go from raw material to end drug product uh, at the size and scale to make drugs for you know one patient at a time. Uh, and the technology really is moving that quickly, and there's a lot of companies working to make that, you know, that that um, drug in a box type type approach. And then we can we can really go after all sorts of different different diseases. Great, thank Hi, you. Uh, this is a voice from the back. Um, I have a question in a similar vein as the previous question, um, and I was wondering how you would design um, or adapt the design of clinical trials to uh, look at the validation of drugs that are made for a specific individual? Yeah, that's, that's a fascinating question. And, and, and essentially, the, the requirement is that you establish the, um, uh, the, the clinical proof of concept so that you show for a number of individual patients that a specific process, for, ex for, for example, for a personalized cancer vaccine, you show that a specific process for um, uh, uh, taking the, the tumor from that patient, sequencing the DNA, selecting um, particular um, proteins that are expressed by that tumor, and then developing a vaccine against those, uh, or creating a vaccine against those proteins, administering that to the patient, and, and then following the outcome in that individual patient. So you're, you're essentially um, going to the regulatory agencies um, uh, with uh, a series of studies on individual patients that support the approach you're taking, the methodology you're using, the technology you're using, and then requesting approval to apply that more broadly um, uh, to, a, to, uh, to a general patient population. And there's, and there's groups out there, um, there's a group in particular, a non-for-profit called NLORM that's doing, doing this exact thing for 
um, kids with rare diseases, uh, going right from, from sequence to, to drug of a sister uh, technology called antisense oligonucleotides. Uh, and they have a drug master file, a path through the regulatory to be able to make these types of medicines. So the field's pushing forward, I think, in really interesting ways right now. Well, I know that we'd like to continue with the questions. Um, and there's, uh, I think what I'll ask is, I think David from Life Sciences BC can tell us about what our next steps for the night is, but I think we're gonna have to wrap up this panel. Um, so maybe uh, just, I, just uh, if you could join me in thanking um, Dr. Cullis, Dr. Duncan, Dr. Madden, and Dr. Taylor for what was a really fun panel. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming today. I think as things start to return to normal from COVID-19, um, it's easy to forget how difficult it was to manage through that whole thing. And it's important to reflect on some of the lessons learned. And I think one of the big lessons we learned in Canada as a country is that we do not have a strong enough life sciences sector. And we don't have enough biomanufacturing to serve our own population during times of emergencies. And so there is a lot of work to do here and we do have to build that life sciences industry and build that biomanufacturing capacity. And I do think we are gonna be successful. There's a lot of work going on right now. And I also really firmly believe that British Columbia is gonna play a major role in doing this. You know, if you look at uh, the things we have in place in British Columbia to make this successful, we have some of the best academic institutions in the world here in British Columbia. We have UBC, UVic, SFU, and the research that they're doing in life sciences at these universities is really first class. And it's really that science that is the foundation of life sciences companies. So we have you know, that covered in spades. In addition to that, the there's a very entrepreneurial spirit at, at these universities and the professors and the postdocs and the researchers. You know, they're willing to take the risks that they need to take in order to commercialize the technologies that they develop at the universities. And they get a lot of support from not-for-profit institutions here in BC, like Admari, which is an organization that's really whole mandate is to help commercialize these technologies, get these companies started, and then grow them to mid-size and large pharmaceutical companies. And they're also supported by organizations like Life Science Bridges Columbia, who are bringing people together to discuss the issues that we're facing. But they also spend a lot of time and do a lot of work behind the scenes, working with the government to make sure that the policies that are put in place are supportive for the industry and create the right environment. And I can say, I can honestly say that government is listening. They, they recently released their biomanufacturing, life sciences and biomanufacturing strategy about a month ago. Within that document, they lay out four or five key things that they need to do in order to support the industry. And it's not just the document that they published, they're actually doing it and they're making investments. They made a major investment in BCIT a few months ago to build a training program for biomanufacturing, which is much needed here in the province. And they're also making investments in building facilities and lab space, which is also really important and much needed. So I do think we are gonna to rise to the challenge and I do think that British Columbia is gonna play a major role in doing that. And if you need any proof, you just have to look at the three companies here and just look at the contribution that Acuitas, Abcelera, and Precision Biosystems made to the COVID-19 response, not just here in British Columbia, but worldwide, it was truly outstanding. So thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I think there's a reception next. If there's, um, you know, if you wanna learn more about the industry or more about any of the companies here, uh, feel free to come up and talk to one of the panelists or myself. We'd be happy to chat. Thank you.